Professor Stiglitz, ladies and gentlemen, sisters and brothers. My name is Yvonne Weldon. I'm a Wiradjuri woman from Cowra here in New South Wales. I'm from the waters of the Clare, also known as the Lachlan, and of the Murrumbidgee Rivers. I'm the elected chairperson of the Metropolitan Lake Aboriginal Land Council, who are the culture authority under the Aboriginal Land Rights Act for the land we're meeting on. I'd like to pay my respects to all elders past and present, and to all First Nations and non-First Nations people here this evening. We're meeting here on the lands of the Eora Nation. The boundaries of the traditional owners are not defined by the hand or by the pen, but through the natural landscapes of the earth. The Eora Nation's country covers the Hawke's River in the north, the Nepean in the west, and the Georges River in the south. My people have practised our traditions for thousands of years and endless generations. One tradition that is shared in various forms across Australia is a welcome to country. As you travel across this beautiful continent of ours, understand during entering the land of a nation, a tribe and a clan, which has existed here for over 60,000 years. The First Nations of this country are the oldest living culture of the world. Our practices and our traditions have sustained us and they are embedded into the core of this nation. On behalf of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, the Elders and the members, I welcome everyone to the land of the Gadigal and acknowledge the Gadigal people whose spirits and ancestors will always remain with this land, our Mother Earth. The First Nations of this country are the most diverse, resilient, unique and sustainable people on the planet. And to give recognition of our survival and also the challenges being faced by my people, could you all please pause for a moment to remember the many that have gone before us, the ones that walk beside us, and others soon to be following in our footsteps. There have been many lessons learned at our expense and our devastation. They should and must be acknowledged, not out of a guilt, but to listen, learn and to come together, to commence a healing and creating a future for all. So don't live regretting what we should have done, but create the legacy of what must be done. As you connect, learn and share, today, tomorrow and beyond, Continue to lead the way, never losing sight of the important work that still needs to be done to bring my people, your people and our people together. Not just through a heartache, but through a healing. Let's make real changes, not just symbolic ones. All of us can make a positive change in this country now and into the future. To make that future possible, let us all draw upon my people's spirits as we continue on our journey. May my people's spirits walk with you and guide you as we strive forward for us all. Again, on behalf of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, welcome to Gadigal land. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Thank you and have a wonderful evening. <laughs>
dear friends, thank you for joining us here tonight and welcome to the 2018 City of Sydney Peace Prize Lecture and Awards Ceremony. My name is Mariana Brungs. I'm the director of the Sydney Peace Foundation and I'm so happy to be with you all tonight to celebrate Professor Joseph Stiglitz and his work on economic inequality. I too would like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Thank you, Yvonne, for the welcome to country, and thank you also to the amazing musicians for their performance. I'd also like to thank Oxfam Australia, the Australia Institute, and the Balnaves Foundation for their support for this year's Sydney Peace Prize program. This is the 21st year of the Sydney Peace Prize, Australia's only international prize for peace. For over two decades, we've been shining a spotlight on Peace Prize recipients and helping these incredible people to share their message and story with Australia and the world. We've been honoured to award the prize to inspiring leaders like Archbishop Desmond Tutu, Mary Robinson, Naomi Klein, Julian Burnside and Mohammed Yunus, among many others. These people prove with their work that peace with justice is possible, that people from different backgrounds can live together happily, can fulfil their potential and can create the best versions of themselves and of their societies, if given a chance. Tonight, the Foundation is absolutely thrilled to be awarding this year's Sydney Peace Prize to the world-renowned economist and Nobel laureate Professor Joseph Stiglitz for his work on economic inequality. As you may know, the Peace Prize is awarded after a long and comprehensive jury process. The jury's citation for Professor Stiglitz's selection reads, for leading a global conversation about the crisis caused by economic inequality, for exposing the violence inflicted by market fundamentalism, and for championing just solutions to the defining challenge of our time. How can we break the cycle of power and greed to enable all peoples and the planet to flourish? We all know the terrible figures about the level of inequality in our world today. More than half the world lives on less than $10 a day. The richest 1% across the world owns more, much more wealth than all the rest combined. And in Australia, where we cherish the idea of a fair go, the top 1% of Australians own much more than the bottom 70% combined. As Professor Stiglitz has pointed out many times, it doesn't have to be this way. This level of inequality has been created through the deliberate policy choices of people in power to maintain their own power and their own privilege. Professor Stiglitz's work shows us a clear path towards a more just and a more sustainable world where we share prosperity and where the economic system works for everyone. Every single person here tonight can help to make that happen in your own way and in your own communities. We have a fantastic program tonight to, to showcase Professor Stiglitz's vision. Professor Stiglitz will soon deliver the City of Sydney Peace Prize Lecture. Following this, Laura Tingle, the ABC's chief political correspondent and one of Australia's top journalists, will delve further into how we can help to achieve greater equality in a discussion with Professor Stiglitz. The Lord Mayor Clover Moore will then present the Sydney Peace Prize, this beautiful trophy beside me, to Professor Stiglitz, and then I'll return to close the evening. It now gives me great pleasure to welcome Professor Stiglitz to the stage. Please join me.
Well, it's a real pleasure to be in Sydney uh, and to speaking uh, in Town Hall again. Uh, and it's a real pleasure to see such a, a large and enthusiastic uh, audience. It's also a real pleasure uh, to be at the opposite side of the world from President Trump. <laughs> and to be in a country where people are debating the question of how to reduce inequality, where, in contrast to the United States, where the Republicans are trying to figure out how to increase it. I grew up in a time that came to be called the golden age of capitalism in America, the 1950s. Though I didn't know that it was called that golden age, and it didn't seem so golden at the time. I grew up in Gary, Indiana, founded in 1906 as the home of the largest integrated steel mill in the world. What I saw as a young boy was massive inequalities, huge racial discrimination, constant labor strife, with episodic strikes and recessions, uh, periods in which my classmates had not even a dime of spending money. I went off to a rustic New England college, Amherst College. Uh, my ambition was to become a theoretical physicist. But the problems I saw as a young kid, and the larger problems that I saw of a similar ilk on a national scale, kept gnawing at me until at the end of my third year, I switched to economics. Like many of the young people here in the audience, I wanted to change the world. As a young undergraduate, I led a group of classmates to go down to the South to help integrate what had been a racially segregated school. Later that year, others doing similar acts of defiance would be killed. As a graduate student, I joined Martin Luther King in his famous March on Washington. His I Have a Dream speech has been a guiding star for everyone who was at that speech for the rest of their lives. Martin Luther King taught us that peace, racial justice, and social economic justice are inseparable, and that will be one of my themes today. Fast forward some 50 years. I had hoped over the interim 50 years, much of which I spent understanding better uh, the economy and what caused uh, inequality, I had hoped we would have broken down the racial discrimination, and I had hoped that we would have increased equality and equality of opportunity. After all, we had become so much wealthier that everyone could have had a decent life. But we in the United States, as in many other countries, have become a rich country with poor people. As I studied inequality, especially beginning in the late 70s and early 80s, it became worse, in some ways much worse. Many of our societies around the world are being divided as almost never before. Two groups seeing the world in such different ways. One group wanting to impose its worldview on the other and not letting the other create the kind of world of social justice that they would like to have. A hundred years ago, the United States was riven by such divisions between those who saw slavery as an intolerable abomination and the other who saw a livelihood depending on one's exploitation of another and who somehow had constructed a moral compass in which that was permissible. Today, we have a large part of one party, a minority of the country, attempting to impose its will on the majority in ways which deprive large proportions, both today and the future, of their basic rights, both their economic and political rights. I will talk this evening a great deal about America, and it's partly because I understand it, I know it better, I know the data, and I've studied it. Uh, but it's par partly because it shows the dangers what lies ahead uh, for Australia. Uh, we don't have a patent, a monopoly on bad policies. <laughs> uh, you have politicians who would like you to follow the United States in creating more inequality. And 
my message to you tonight, which I'll repeat a couple of times, is just simple. Don't let them. <laughs> and I'll try to explain a little bit about how we've created that kind of inequality in the United States and how one can fight against it. Let me try to explain some of the examples of the dissonance between what a majority of Americans want and what Trump and a minority are trying to impose. A majority of Americans believe that if you work hard full time, you and your family should not, still not be in poverty. Yet today in America, the minimum wage is but $7.25 an hour. The same level adjusted for inflation that it was 60 years ago. Imagine, for more than a half a century, those at the bottom have gotten no pay rise. Some three quarters of Americans believe that the, that the minimum wage should be increased dramatically, yet Congress refuses. The result? One-seventh of Americans are on food stamps. But even with food assistance, almost one-seventh of the country goes to bed hungry regularly, not because they are on a diet, but because they cannot afford the food they need. 20% of American children are growing up in poverty, this supposedly in the richest country in the world. While a vast majority believe that there should be an increase in the minimum wage, our Congress refuses to increase the minimum wage or to provide adequate help for these children growing up in poverty. It should be obvious what this portends for the future. The response across the country shows both hope and the ugliness that is in the land. Hope because across the country, grassroots movements are rising demanding an increase in the minimum wage. Seattle and others from coast to coast have more than doubled the minimum wage to $15 an hour. Still small relative to some other countries, but better than we've had. What has happened has corroborated innumerable academic studies. Little, if any, adverse effects on employment. In some cases, the level of employment has actually increased as the increased income stimulate the economy and create jobs. But we have also seen the uglier side of the response. In many states, employers have gotten together to get states to pass laws preventing communities from raising the minimum wage, just as they work to curb unionization and the ability of workers to collect a bargain effectively. Just as they designed globalization to weaken workers' bargaining power further and provided no assistance to those who have lost their jobs. If one wants to know why it is that wages have stagnated while productivity has increased enormously over the last 40 years, there is a simple reason. There has been a concerted attempt to suppress wages, weaken unions, and workers collective act, uh, uh, acting together collectively. And guess what? It worked. We're suffering the consequences. We're suffering the consequences economically, politically, and in terms of the divisions in our society. There are many other issues on which the vast majority of Americans want change, but a minority are blocking the way. We've had a mass shooting almost once a day for the past year. The vast majority want better gun control. How can we weigh the right to carry an assault weapon versus the right of individuals to live, let alone to live in peace? The president says that when you pray in a synagogue or church, you should have armed guards around you and carry weapons. What kind of society is that? The vast majority of Americans believe our banks should be better regulated so that they don't cause another great recession, so they don't continue engaged in their predatory activities, moving money from the bottom of the pyramid to the top. And yet, the best we can do was to pass an inadequate law, which the banks immediately began working to roll back. 
Today, we have a banking system which is at risk of once again imposing another crisis on the world. Here in Australia, I gather you've had a commission which exposed the lack of scruples of your banking system. I don't want to seem competitive about this, <laughs> but I think uh, even the, the best of your banks can't compete with Goldman Sachs. Uh, what it did in the 1MDB scandal, robbing an entire nation, Malaysia, of billions of dollars, really is uh, reflects the fact that America does things bigger and better than other countries. Uh, we have more inequality, less inequality of, op less, uh, equality of opportunity, and the worst banks in the world. America has one of the most advanced medical systems in the world. Our universities are making breakthroughs every day. And yet, while the U.S. spends more per capita than any other country on health, some 18% of our GDP, our outcomes are among the worst among the advanced countries. And matters are getting worse. For the last several years, life expectancy in the United States is falling. Part of this is because of a lack of health insurance. The U.S. is the only advanced country that doesn't recognize the right to health as a basic human right. And the Republicans have stripped health insurance from millions of Americans, making their lives even more precarious. Most Americans want better coverage, but our government is depriving health care for millions and millions. As a last example, it should be obvious that climate change presents an exist existential risk to the world. The U.S. has faced hurricanes and forest fire, Australia droughts, other places floods. The oil and, and gas companies and coal companies have known about the dangers for decades and have tried to hide it from us. Science predicted this more than 100 years ago before we had the instruments to measure what was going on. It was another triumph uh, another of the triumphs of science. But now that we see the evidence, we are still doing almost nothing. The cost of doing something is negligible compared to the risk of not doing so. We can't afford not to do more. A modest price of carbon, a small cost to the economy. Yet we are willing to risk the future of our children. One of the actions I am most proud of is being an expert witness in a suit that is being brought on behalf of 21 young children against the Trump administration, which I wrote about in one of the uh, Australian newspapers this morning. The children are rightly claiming that they are being deprived of their basic rights, the right to live a future without the risks of the traumas that climate change is presenting. The suit should go to trial in Oregon in the next few weeks, and I am very hopeful that the children will win. Conservatives talk about the dangers of deficit spending because of the harms it does future generations. But anyone, anyone who cares about future generations has to support a strong carbon policy. It is simply immoral not to do that. Of course, in the United States, the Republicans showed this talk about fiscal responsibility was all hypocrisy. They have cultivated a very simple set of values based on short-term greed. Money in the pocket of the rich today over everything else. And they are willing to change the economic and political rules of the game to get it. In three weeks between December 2017 and January 2018, they doubled the deficit, historically unprecedented in an economy at full employment and not at war. Next year, our deficit is expected to be in excess of $1 trillion. And for those of you who don't know this American, a trillion dollars is a billion billion. And uh, again, for those of you who uh, don't uh, no economics. That's a lot of money. <laughs> It'd be one thing 
if the money were being spent on schools, on infrastructure, on research. But the Trump administration says we can't afford those luxuries. Rather, we squander the money on still more money for weapons that don't work against enemies that don't exist. The good thing is the enemies don't exist. And for tax cuts on corporations and billionaires. Our Republican congressman pretended to buy the hokum that it would lead to more investment. If they were interested, of course, they could have turned to the detailed study of the effects of corporate tax cuts in Australia by Andrew Charlton, a beautiful study showing that they don't work, they don't increase investment. You were lucky. You still have enough people who believe in science and evidence, and with that evidence, you turn the proposal of cutting the corporate income tax down. We didn't. And what's happened is exactly as predicted. The vast majority of the funds went to dividends and stock buybacks with no evidence of a sustained uptick in investment and only minor morsels going to workers, on average some 10 cents an hour. Unfortunately, what happens in the U.S. has consequences abroad, both because of the role that the U.S. necessarily plays in global governance, an example which the U.S. sets. Too many would follow Trump down a road of blaming others, immigrants and foreign trade agreements, for our own mistakes. Such demagogues offer no real solutions. Wars, whether trade wars or military wars, leave everyone worse off. It is no accident that belligerents like Trump at one moment are stirring economic conflict and another armed conflict. He wants every country in NATO and the Western alliance to spend 4% of its income on GDP for still more weapons that don't work against enemies that don't exist. The last Republican president led us into armed conflict in the Middle East in a war that violated international law on pretenses, pretenses that were false. I wrote about this in my book, The Three Trillion Dollar War, with Linda Bilmes of Harvard. When we wrote it, we said the numbers were vastly conservative. Today, we know how conservative they were. With more than half of those coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq disabled, the cost of health care and support for these alone are estimated at well over $1 trillion. And yet, this war has, all, has only led to less peace, more conflict in the region. The American administration would like one to forget about those that died in vain in that conflict, just as they would like, uh, just as they would like us to forget about those who died in vain in Vietnam or in World War I, whose hundredth anniversary we commemorate, commemorated on Sunday. And yet, this war, the war in Afghanistan, goes on and on. Now in its 18th year, and no sign of peace in the horizon. And think of what we could do, have done with the three to five trillion dollars that we squandered on that conflict. And this brings me to one of the other central messages of this talk. I'm an economist and I naturally see the world through the lens of economics. One, not the only one, but an important source of conflict around the world is economic inequality. As I said, economic inequality has soared in the past four decades and the U.S. is the worst case. Countries that have emulated us have approached our atrocious numbers. This should be an important warning. Some of your politicians and those in Europe used to look at the U.S. GDP numbers and sought to emulate us. GDP isn't a good measure of what is happening to a society. What we care about is standards of living and not just of Jim Bezos or Bill Gates, but of the average American. The average income of the bottom 90% of Americans has stagnated for the past four decades, while the top 1% have done very well. Earlier, I mentioned the fact that real wages at the bottom are the same as they were 60 years ago. Those without a college education have seen their incomes go down, and this is especially true for males 
And if you want to understand uh, the kind of support that Trump has gotten, you look at the angry young men, uh, middle-aged men or older men in the Trump rallies, you can understand, uh, seeing the numbers, why that is. The income in the middle of a full-time male worker in the United States is at the same level that it was more than four decades ago. And the full-time workers are the lucky ones. 20% of the male workers can't get a full-time job. Can you imagine a country calling itself successful when large fractions of the population haven't had a pay rise in 40, 50, or 60 years? America used to think of itself as a land of opportunity, the American dream. Each generation would be better off than the last, and background didn't matter. Yet only 37% of adults expect their children to be better off financially. And among all the advanced countries, a child's life pro American child's life prospects are more dependent on the income and education of his parents than in almost any of the other advanced countries. I jokingly tell my students, there's one important uh, decision, choice, they have to make in their lives, and that is choosing the right parents. <laughs> and if you, make, if you mess up on that mistake, uh, the game is over. Uh, the idea that America uh, is uh, the American dream uh, is, unfortunately, today a myth. Of course, newspapers write about people who make it from the bottom to the top or the middle to the top, and the reason they write about it is because it is so unusual. I could go on, but the picture is clear and bleak. But there are large differences across countries, and yet the underlying forces that many people attribute to the increase in inequality to are global in nature, technological change and globalization. And what we learn from that is that inequality is a choice. Australia once was a beacon, but it no longer shines so brightly. It is not the worst of the advanced countries, but it is far from the best. Countries like Australia with large endowments of resources should be at the top. After all, the resources really belong to everyone, and the proceeds can be used to create a shared prosperity. You can tax labor and it might not work as much. You can tax capital and people might not save. But natural resources or taxing land, the land can't move and go to another country. Norway has shown how one can use natural resources to create a dynamic and fair society. You are a rich natural resource country. In the case of Norway, they not only have created a dynamic and rich country, they put away more than $1 trillion in a sovereign wealth fund to be divided among only 4 million, 5 million people. Well, as I said before, inequality is a choice. You or your politicians have made a choice that is different from that of Norway. You've chosen more inequality and to put away less for your future. And unfortunately, you and your children will have to bear the consequences. The political science literature has shown that when inequality is, mark, uh, is great across subgroups of the economy, is especially prone to give rise to conflict. And unfortunately, in the U.S. and many other countries, that is the case. Our election saw a huge divide between urban and rural, between men and women, between those with a college education and those without, between people of color and especially white males. Most disturbing in this election is that the supporters of Trump have been creating their own reality, making themselves immune from information, evidence, and science. News that runs counter to what they believe they label fake news. They read their own newspapers and go to their own websites. 21st com century communications technologies have made it more difficult for us to form a national community and to reach a common understanding.
This is especially important because we know a lot both about how to create economic growth and how to reduce inequality. We've been studying these matters for years, and economic science has provided some important insights. We know that one of the bases of the wealth of nations is learning, the advances in technology for modern science. The other is social institutions, which enable us to cooperate and live productively together. Notions like the rule of law, markets constrained by publicly set rules and regulations and democracy with checks and balances. Obviously, to make our complex society work, we have to have truth-telling institutions like the media, the judiciary, the scientific establishment, and our universities, which gather, process, disseminate information, and assess the truth. Trump and the Republicans tell us that truth is not important, and they have waged a full-scale war against all of these institutions. They have attacked the press, and they have taxed our great universities like Harvard and Princeton. The big lie and the attack on the truth on the foundations of our, of our epistemology is precisely what fascists everywhere have done. There is an important distinction between what gives... There is an important distinction between what gives rise to the wealth of individuals and what gives rise to the wealth of nations. Many individuals get wealthy by exploiting others. This is the basis of the wealth of the South of the U.S. before, before the Civil War. It was based on exploit, uh, exploiting slavery. It is the basis of the wealth of many of our banks as they engage in predatory lending. It is the basis of the wealth of much of our new tech giants who have exploited by their monopoly, their, uh, uh, their monopoly power in the big data, which they have taken from us. Our for-profit universities, like Trump University, have learned how to exploit the dreams of those who wanted to get ahead, giving them nothing in return. To too large an extent, modern capitalism is based on wealth exploitation rather than wealth creation. In the former, one gets rich by taking from others, in the latter, from adding to the national pie. We often refer to the former as ring seekers, and our society has become rife with rank seeking. Two changes have made things w matters worse. There has been innovation in rank seeking. The rank seekers have found better ways of exploiting the rest. And since the era of Reagan and Thatcher all over the world, the rules of the game have been rewritten to advantage those at the top and to allow more rank seeking. Antitrust and competition policy have been weakened, and so has the bargaining power of workers, partly by weakening the foundations of collective bargaining, partly by globalization gone awry. Financialization has resulted in money leaving corporations rather than going into them, to creating new, uh, and have encouraged the excesses that I talked about earlier. Yes, there are underlying drivers like globalization and technological change that have had impacts as well. But these two have been shaped by policies, by our rules. With different rules, for instance, technological advances would have been more directed at saving the planet than adding to the roster of the unskilled unemployed. But there are many countries, both in the developed and developing world, that have taken a different way. Even with the underlying global forces, they have managed to contain inequalities. In some cases, they've even reduced it. In this sense, as I said before, inequality is a choice. It is not driven by the laws of nature, but by the laws of man. We should be aware, as bad as things are today, they could get worse. The threat of AI and big data, for instance, going forward means that everything we have seen in the last 40 years could get much, much worse. A reminder, um, and, and, and climate change is going to also pose uh, uh, challenges making things, uh, inequality, uh, that much worse. But another world is possible. Indeed, the analysis I have just provided is a cause for hope. If it is our policies that have brought about this sorry state of affairs, then changing those policies can help create another world. One of the insights of recent research is that more equal societies actually perform better.
Conflict is not good for economic performance. In a divided society, one can't even get consensus behind basic public investments in technology, education, and infrastructure. In this new world, there will be greater role for government. A modern society is based on innovation, and behind all innovation is basic research, and basic re research basically has to be publicly funded. We live in complex urban environments where there is greater need for public services, public transportation, the provision of public amenities, and so forth. We live in a time of continual economic transformation, and markets don't make these transformations well on their own. All of the successful trans transitions have required a large role for collective action. Of course, government must innovate, and indeed, there has been enormous innovation in the public sector, not always reflected well in our statistics. Though our population has expanded enormously in the past 50 years, and the range of services provided by the government has expanded, the absolute number of government bureaucrats administering this wide range of services in the United States has actually diminished. There are further innovations which will make a basic middle-class life attainable to large fractions of the population. We are so much richer today than we were say 50 years ago, and yet so, so many people in our society are finding it more and more difficult to attain the basic prerequisites of a middle class life. And why is that? It shouldn't be. It should be that because we're wealthier, we should have more security and a better life. But it's not the way things have worked out. And it's because of the political choices that we made. As I said, there are many innovations. Australia's income contingent loan program is an example of social innovation that has been copied in other countries. Public options and mortgages, health insurance and retirement programs are other ideas that are being discussed. We can redesign social insurance programs to provide greater security at lower cost. In short, we need a new social contract for the 21st century and a new economic vision. We're seeing in the United States a foreshadowing of the dystopia into which we so may easily fall, with a few at the top having lives of comfort, the rest struggling to get by. This needn't be. Australia should not take for granted what it has. There are politicians, as I said before, who would like to take away the, 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 the programs that have led to your prosperity, to your shared prosperity. Don't let them. The simple message of this talk is that we don't need to have the kind of divided society that we see in the United States and so many other countries, a dystopia into which Australia could fall, so easily fall. Another world is possible, a world with more prosperity, shared and sustainable prosperity. Indeed, the only sustainable prosperity is shared prosperity. We know how to obtain it. The economics is clear. The challenge today is not the economics, but in our politics. Thank you. Thank you so much for your speech, Professor Stiglitz, and your contribution. Let's begin at the end of your lecture. You say, in this new world, there will be a greater role for government. And you speak of this greater role for government as including the need for greater public funding of innovation and public services, and of a general recognition of the need for collective action. But can you paint a slightly more detailed picture of what this greater role of government might look like? That is, is there some sweet point in recent history uh, of levels of government intervention or types of government intervention that we should be aiming for? Uh, 
Is there a time that members of the audience would remember or a sense of government they would recognise? Well, you know, maybe the, the, the most obvious example is uh, when we had a hurricane, say, in the United States, uh, who did we turn to? We t turned to the government to respond to the hurricanes. And the same thing when you have floods, when you have disaster. We all realize that we individually can't protect ourselves. So that's the, 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 the extreme case where we know we have to have government. But also, we should be clear, you know, a lot of these natural disasters are climate-related disasters, and we need collective action to prevent climate change. You know, individuals can do what they can, but this is a, a global event, and it's, each of us, are, each country is making a contribution, so each country has to do what it can, and that has to be done as a collective action across within the country and across countries. Uh, I think of there being three uh, major areas where you need uh, collective action. Um, the first, markets don't exist in a vacuum. They have to be structured. They have to be structured with rules and regulations. We saw what happened when we structured them the wrong way with our banks. And so you have to have public decisions about the rules and regulations to make the market economy function. Um, the second thing is uh, you need investment. Uh, and I, I talked about research, uh, uh, infrastructure, technology. Uh, if we're going to have shared prosperity in the future, uh, you know, one of the important reasons why we're having the growth and inequality is inadequate investments in education. And we know that it has to begin preschool before five years old, because by the time they're five years old, there are huge differences already built in. So uh, um, the uh, inadequate in public investments, you know, parents, you know, the idea on the right is that if you're a five-year-old, you should go to the bank and borrow money uh, so that you can make your investment in education. Now, that idea of a free market exclusion is obviously absurd. Um, you need, as a country, to invest in the future in the children. So that's the second area. And the third is social protection. You know, the, the, uh, I mentioned uh, in response to crises, but old age, health care, uh, every country recognizes the need for public provision of health care, except the United States. Um, and uh, uh, it goes, you know, unemployment. The private market doesn't provide adequate protection if you lose your job. Uh, and so those areas of social protection are very important. And in all three areas, there's been uh, a weakening of the resolve of the importance of collective action. In research, the percentage of GDP that we're spending in research in the United States is lower than it's been in a half a century. And yet we're supposedly a more innovation economy. Uh, and you can go through each of the categories where rather than our spending more as we get wealthier, we're actually uh, withdrawing. So you're talking about uh, greater intervention in terms of regulation and greater in in, um, intervention in terms of government spending effectively. Um, What's the current state of evidence about the relationship between the size of the government sector, economic dynamism, which of course is the free marketeer's great call, and the overall welfare of a society? So, uh, my view, you know, when you begin asking that kind of question, you first have to understand uh, that GDP is not a good measure of the success of a country. So, a lot of people do statistical studies without realizing how bad a measure of GDP. It doesn't really represent uh, how well a society is performing. Uh, U.S. GDP before the 2008 crisis was going up, but the fact was it was based on a, a mountain of debt. Uh, I talked before about how GDP is going up, yet most Americans are not sharing in that prosperity. So it's not really a good measure 
of how well society is doing. Uh, the, and so uh, the, the uh, studies that have looked at the relationship between the share of GDP spent on uh, um, uh, going to the government and growth is, is really not a really meaningful way. Uh, are, those studies are not very meaningful. But what is very clear, if you go back and ask where have the major transformations come from, what are the big things that have changed our lives and who has supported them, they haven't come from the private sector. Uh, the private sector has played a very important role in bringing some basic ideas to the market and developing them. But the basic uh, things like the discovery of DNA, which has changed medicine, uh, the basic advances that uh, led to uh, the modern computer, uh, to the internet, uh, even the browser was developed by the US government. So if you think about you know, all the things that have transformed our life, they really rest on a foundation of uh, public investments in technology and science. Um, well, I just want to go through the sort of arguments that are made by the free marketeers and, um, and, uh, and how you sort of come back at them, if you like. You spent um, a good part of your career fighting the so-called Washington Consensus, um, which is small government, low tax, minimal welfare, uh, and which have really dominated policy making, certainly through um, my professional lifetime. Uh, but at the same time, we've seen um, an increased pace in globalisation, and that raises an obvious question, which is, uh, when you're trying to intervene in an economy, have you got the same capacity as a government or as a public sector to influence your own economy as you once did, uh, given the pace of globalisation? No, I mean, it, it is clear that globalisation has put some constraints on governments but not in the areas that we've been talking about, in the areas that affect uh, research. In fact, it's even more important for countries to be engaged in those kinds of investment, not in the areas of social protection. I mean, one of the important insights, uh, you know, uh, one of the institutions that, that uh, pushed the Washington consensus was the IMF. Uh, and, you know, uh, uh, they're not a left-wing, institution. Um, but today, they've been going around the world arguing that greater, uh, that societies, economies with more equality perform better. They've been pointing out that uh, used to be that people talked about what was called the big trade-off. You could only have more equality by sacrificing growth. And they say, no, that's not true. That, in fact, societies which have more equality actually perform better, grow faster, and are more stable. And some of the reasons that I talked about in my talk are the reasons for that. If you have more inequality, you have greater division, you have more instability, social, uh, political instability, uh, and you can't get the consensus about behind those really important investments, public investments, that I talked about before. So in more divided societies, you get less investment than in, in those things like infrastructure, technology, and education, and that leads to lower economic growth. I'd like, I'll come back to this question about the change of heart at the IMF, but um, a, a, an issue that uh, is related to the whole free market globalisation push, which has a, had a huge influence on, um, on Australian policy making, is the idea that if you lift wages in a small open economy with a floating exchange rate, the exchange rate should just adjust to restore overall competitiveness. But doesn't that suggest we've been sold a bit of a pup on the international competitiveness issue, that the ultimate question is just about how income is shared between labour and capital? That's right. Okay. <laughs> Good. Uh, well, we'll move on in that case. 
So, so the big question as you finished your, uh, uh, your talk is about politics rather than economics. And I, I noted that uh, in 2012, you were asked by uh, the German magazine Der Spiegel how you expected the next president of the United States to tackle the problem of unequal distribution of wealth. And you answered, first, he has to recognise there's a problem. Now, it seems that the president elected in 2016 has tapped into that issue of unequal distribution of wealth. But uh, somewhere along the road, the politics has taken a rather bizarre turn. Um, and as you say, Trump supporters have created their own reality. Do we have to wait for them to realise they've been duped by his economic agenda before things can change? Uh, well, I think you know, the point is absolutely clear. What he did is he tapped into the discontent, the, particularly the groups that were uh, um, experiencing the effects of deindustrialization uh, in the South, in the, in the Midwest. And, uh, you know, I talked about for instance, the, the uh, 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 stagnation in their incomes, uh, one of the things that is really disturbing uh, is, uh, I talked about the decline in life expectancy. Uh, if you look at what is going on in these parts of the United States, uh, there is an increase of what uh, Ann Case and Angus Deaton, uh, Angus Deaton got the Nobel Prize in 2015, he calls deaths of despair. What is really soaring in these regions uh, is uh, deaths as a result of suicide, uh, drug overdose, and alcoholism. And the only time I've ever seen anything like this was when I was chief economist of the World Bank, and we were studying uh, what was going on in Russia, partly because of the mismanagement of, Wash uh, uh, of Russia under the Washington consensus, the transition from communism to a market economy was supposed to ra raise their incomes. In fact, their incomes went down by one third. We couldn't believe it. You know, we couldn't believe the data that their incomes were going down when our theory was that moving to a market economy was supposed to raise their income. But when we started getting uh, demographic data saying that their life expectancy was going down dramatically, especially among males, and especially related to these deaths of despair, we knew something dramatic was going on. And that's what's been happening in the United States. So Trump tapped into that, but he'd exploited it. I mean, it's like dem demagogues everywhere. He knew, he knew where there was discontent, and he knew how to dupe them basically. Unfortunately, we're not seeing any awakening to the fact that things aren't working out well. You know, there are places where the result of the trade war, uh, which was supposed to bring manufacturing back, is actually uh, going exactly the other way. And rather than responding in anger, so far their answer is, well, these are the sacrifices we have to make for our country. Uh, so it isn't clear how quickly they're going to respond. But the, the, what gives me hope and it is, is what I talked about uh, here, the grassroots movements of trying to raise the minimum wage I talked about going across the country, the young people uh, in the election uh, that we just had, uh, the outpouring of young people who care a lot about the environment, who care a lot about the social injustices that I've been talking about. So I don't think we are necessarily going to be able to persuade those particular groups to change their view quickly. I think we're going to have to try to mobilize the rest of the country to see how bad things are going. And I think that's going to be our, our answer. And I, I think y y you saw that in the change of the votes, for instance, in the suburban areas where people said, you know, uh, we still believe in, in facts and truth. And Controversial. <laughs> yeah. Um, because one of the really fascinating uh, things about the U.S. in particular, which you pointed out in Vanity Fair in 2011, is that the, the, the consensus goes across class and wealth about what needs to be done. You don't have the sorts of 
you know, divisions um, on income levels or uh, labour versus capital levels that you once had. It, the, the divisions are much more complicated this time round. Yeah, what, what, I, the, the uh, article I wrote in 2011, I, I, you know, I've been studying uh, income distribution uh, for my whole uh, life, and uh, I wrote a, a, a paper uh, that I published in, I, I wrote in 1966, but I published in 69. Uh, on what I thought, still think, is the, the best theoretical paper on the distribution of income, modestly. Um, <laughs> but I published it in Econometrica, um, and then in 2011, as the problems of inequality got larger, I wrote a, another article. Uh, this time I called it uh, Of the 1%, For the 1%, and By the 1%. And I published it in Vanity Fair, uh, and it got read a lot more than my Econometrica article did. Uh, but uh, the reason I, I, I framed it that way, and I talked about the 1%, was to try to point out that it's not, you know, a small class, you know, it's not, we don't have these big class divisions that we had a long time ago. It's really... Uh, a small percentage that has been doing very well. I, I talked about my talk that the bottom 90% have had a fairly stagnant income in the United States. It's not as bad in Australia, but as I said, it could get that bad. Uh, um, but the real divisions then are between this very small number at the top. And you know some of these numbers are are really staggering. Oxfam comes out with a, uh, a study every year at uh, uh, Davos, uh, where uh, you know the muckety mucks get together at every January, and uh, they try to graphically depict what's going on by saying how big of a bus would it require to have as much wealth as the wealth of the bottom. 3.8 billion people. And we're getting much more efficient in inequality. So last January, you only needed a bus with 42 people to have as much wealth as the bottom 3.8 billion people. Mm. Um, I, I, we don't have a lot of time, but there's two, two questions I want to ask you, and it goes back to your point about the IMF. Um, and, and economics in general. Uh, we talked about politics, but how important is the economic consensus, uh, the Washington consensus, uh, at any point of time when we don't seem to uh, sort of really look at uh, experts anymore with great, uh, with great respect? And do you think the economics profes profession is a bit shell-shocked? I mean, have, have they ended up being a bit used by vested interests over the last 30 or 40 years? Uh, Yes, I think they have. I, I think they were uh, captured in a way. You know, people like to be listened to. Uh, and and uh, there was a big demand for people, for, by that 1%, for people who would put forward arguments that they liked. And the 1%, I don't want to say bought them, but effectively bought them. Uh, and uh, they put forward ideas that they sort of believed it in a, in a way. And it was a natural continuation of economic analysis, you might say, from Adam Smith. Uh, he talked about uh, the invisible hand, how individuals and firms pursuing their self-interest would lead as if by an invisible hand to the well-being of society. But for the last 40 years, we know that's it wrong. You know, my own research on uh, the consequences of imperfect and asymmetric information and imperfect risk markets uh, explain why the invisible hand was invisible, because it wasn't there. <laughs> and, and, and so all in this, you know, throughout this era of the Washington Consensus, the advances in economic theory had explained that markets 
often don't work well and that you can't rely just on markets. And then you have to ask, why, why was this push for deregulation, privatization? Uh, why was there this push for unfettered markets, what I sometimes call market fundamentalism? And it was an ideology that actually was running counter to what economic science was saying. So there are a lot of politicians and a lot of people on the right who liked those simplistic ideas and didn't want to bother with all the sophistications that were being developed uh, by economics that talked about the consequences of imperfect information, imperfect competition, imperfect risk markets, and so forth. And they just ignored it. And now we're seeing some of the consequences of that. So. Uh for the purposes of people who are trying to um, reduce inequality in Australia as well as in the United States, what's the most important argument that should be being prosecuted right now? And how do we arm, how do we arm ourselves for arguments about the need for more tax uh, and for higher wages and for getting over the idea that government is a dirty word? Well, I, I think uh, the, there are two parts of it. One. Uh, and both of them I mentioned, or I've already mentioned. One is that the one that the IMF has emphasized, uh, which is economies with greater equality perform better. So this is a pro-growth strategy. The second one is the point that I emphasized. Think about what is the source of the wealth of nations? Why is it that we live better today than we do 250 years ago, you know, for centuries before uh, 1750, the Enlightenment, or 1780, uh, standards of living, living uh, wages had remained constant. You know, they varied a little bit up and down. In the Black Plague, when you killed off a third of the population, wages did go up a little bit. Um, uh, so there were, you know, the, the economics did, you know, there were some changes, but. Uh, Almost nothing happened. Then suddenly, wages started to, and income standards of living started to go up. And what was the reason? And it was the two things I talked about. Advances in science and resting on the foundation of basic research that has to be supported by government. And the social institutions, the rule of law, our democracy, with checks and balances. And that is all about collective action. How do we work together as a society? And how, you know, uh, it's not the law of the jungle. The law of the jungle is you got nowhere. And, and so it is only because we've act, been able to act collectively uh, that we've been able to make progress. Well, hopefully there's a bit more collective action in us yet. Thank you so much for talking to us tonight. Good evening, everyone. I can't tell you what a great sight it is for a mayor to see a town hall packed with people like this. People who have come to honour and to listen to Professor Stiglitz. So I know you're all progressive, so isn't that fantastic? A town hall. <laughs> And of course, uh, Professor Stiglitz is a truly outstand, outstanding recipient for the Sydney Peace Prize. And it has been quite wonderful to listen to his thoughts about equality and justice. 
I, I would like to also acknowledge the original custodians of our land, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to the elders, both past and present. Acknowledge the people of very many nations who live in our city, and welcome all our distinguished guests and, and councils of the city. The Foundation's Sydney Peace Prize honours outstanding contributions to peace, to justice, to non-violence and to human rights. It spurs us all to think about our world, to look for new solu solutions to age-old problems, to listen to some of the world's inspirational thinkers, and to listen for the voices of those who too often aren't heard. I thank the Sydney Peace Foundation for bringing these issues to the cultural and intellectual life of our city, for reinforcing the values on which Sydney is based. The work that Professor Stiglitz has done on economic inequality resonates for us here, as it does in so many different cities and countries. And his urgent advocacy for action on climate change is also very relevant here. For more than three decades, he has helped shape and shift global debates on inequality, both as a distinguished academic and as a player in the policy world. He has never shied away from raising his voice in the battles of global social justice. This is evident most recently in the legal case that he mentioned against the Trump administration, which is being sued by 21 children. Isn't that, isn't that wonderful to think of 21 children <laughs> suing Trump? <laughs> 21 children suing, suing Trump on behalf of themselves and future generations, and for whom Professor Stiglitz is appearing as an expert witness. As a critic of economic globalisation and the domineering role of markets, he has consistently challenged the power of the financial elites and exposed the unfair rules of globalisation. He's astutely described a situation where the undermining of trade unions and worker bargaining power, increasing income disparity and the insult on public education combined to show a breakdown of the social contract. And he is speaking up about the bleak future we are creating for younger generations because of worsening climate change. So tonight, Professor Stieglitz, you have painted a, in many ways a very bleak world. Um, and yet you, you inspire us by talking about the solutions. You know, Professor Stiglitz talks about the fact that we need a new social contract and a new economic vision for the 21st century. And how do we get that? We need to make different political choices. And you know what? We've got two elections coming up in the very near future. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you for showing us the way forward and, and thank you for coming and inspiring us. We need some inspiration. It's pretty, we think it's pretty bleak here too. <laughs> and it is a great honour to present you with the 2018 Sydney Peace Prize. Thank you very much for, for your remarks and, and thank uh, the Sydney Peace Foundation for, for this award. Uh, in many ways, this is uh, uh, the most important award I've ever received. Uh, You know, ideas are important, uh, ideas about uh, asymmetric information and, and uh, mathematical models. But in the end, what really matters is how we live together. And what really matters 
that we learn how to live together in peace and in solidarity. And the recognition of my work in this area is something I greatly appreciate. Thank you.